like the way they used the space. Yeah. We could do that whole side here, it could be all retail. My name is Paul Harris and I'm an entrepreneur. City Council. Oh, a community facilitator, and I do some and I do some work at City Council. I'm a community activist. Paul Harris, Red Deer City Councilor, co-owner of the Sunworks Store downtown, businessman, and community activist. Sure, I'm ready. Paul moved to Red Deer from Calgary in the early 90s. The 1988 Winter Olympics in Calgary were wrapped up. The oil and gas industry had yet to turn around. Back then, not very many people moved to Red Deer. The city's population grew less than 1% a year between 1987 and 1998. Paul moved to Red Deer because it was quiet, to get away from it all. Calgary? I don't know, I just, it was starting, well for me it was just getting a little too big, and the traffic and the noise and everything else, and I just decided I needed a little break. So I came up here and spent the summer with my parents. Probably was 91. Around that time, Red Deer's municipal economic outlook was pointing in a positive direction. Craig Curtis came to Canada near the beginning of that economic uptick. His move to Red Deer was in pursuit of an opportunity. Curtis is an urban planner. Well, in 1980, I immigrated to Canada and then started, uh, actually my first job in Canada was here in Red Deer in 1980. And that was when Ken Curl was mayor and there were a number of interesting ideas bubbling and certainly I was excited to be at the beginning of a number of huge projects which really were uh, transformational for the city in the 80s and 90s. In the early 80s, the population of Red Deer was about half what it is now. Highway 2 had been rerouted around the downtown some decades earlier. The Westerner Exposition was being relocated, the Canadian Pacific Rail Yards were being moved, Bob McGee, first elected in 1980, uh, finished his fourth and final term as mayor in 1992. By then, historic downtown Red Deer was dead. Well, downtown was very barren in the 1980s. There were Virtually no trees in the central core. Uh, there were a number of buildings that were uh, pretty vacant, and really it was a uh, pretty dilapidated downtown, severely impacted by the railway yards and the buildings around it and the old grain elevators. So when we started our business, I mean, that's the story, you know, my story is that I came downtown one Sunday afternoon in about 95, 96, something around there, and to read a book, have a coffee, I drove down, straight down Ross Street here. I was gonna go to what was called the Good Food Company at the corner, and it was closed. There wasn't a car in sight, there wasn't a person on the street. We turned left, I turned left, I turned left, went right back home, and by the time I got home, I was quite angry. I was thinking, you know, and I said to Terry, if Either we need to do something about the culture in this city or we need to move. We need to make that choice because I can't live a place where you can't even get a coffee on a Sunday. The 80s and 90s were not a time when Red Deer intended to build a vibrant, culturally rich downtown. Quite the opposite, in fact. Moving the rail yards and the exposition grounds at the time could be considered an exodus out of downtown. Everyone else left too because that was the trendy thing to do. By the early 90s, if you listened really closely, you could almost hear the outhouse door banging in the wind while walking through downtown Red Deer. There were a number of variety of plans, and it was very controversial in the election of 1980. And uh, those uh, were competing plans to have major investment in the downtown at the time and major investment outside. And uh, I don't know all the history of that. It was before I was here in the city but certainly uh, the um, major redevelopment on the edges, north and south, didn't help the downtown at all during those years. You know, we had been to places that had great downtowns and great neighborhoods already, so we knew what it could be. You need the foot traffic. This is the busiest foot traffic street in the city. They had done some upgrades in the early 90s on the street. They had planted some trees on the street and 
done that pavement on the street. They never did get Little Gates Avenue. But then they stopped really investing in the downtown and the Bay and Zellers and Kreskies, they all moved out. And those buildings sat vacant for years. And partly I think it was the lack of understanding about how downtowns work and the value of them in communities. And it's not because the people that were on council didn't care. It wasn't best practice. People didn't understand the influence of urban sprawl in communities, the, the importance of a downtown to a healthy economy. They didn't get that. It was happening all over North America where downtowns were dying because they were building the suburbs. You know, everybody was building a, another suburb, another strip mall, and these big drive-through box store malls. Those, I mean, that was the trend. That's why we had South Point Common built. And so the focus away from downtown actually hurt our economy in a big way. This focus on investing in the suburbs at the expense of investing in the downtown eventually turns into an acute public funding problem. Urban sprawl is now considered as something to avoid because it can absolutely decimate a community culturally and economically. Healthy downtowns or, or commercial districts, particularly ones that are multi-story, where there's people living and working in them, have the highest tax base that contribute to the operating budgets for cities. So when you let a downtown die, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot because that is the tax base you need in order to have suburbs thrive as well. There's not enough taxes coming from a suburb to support the services that they need. So you need to have our, these high density places where there's commercial and residential to support not only the downtown, but they support the suburbs. Mayor Gail Serkin's administration in 1992 experienced a slight uptick in the price of oil. That set the stage for a new Red Deer. The city set out goals to revitalize itself artistically, culturally, and environmentally in a sustainable, fiscally responsible way. Red Deer received an award in 2003 for those plans from the now defunct Cultural Capital of Canada program. None of it was going to be easy. None of it was going to be cheap. So those plans that were developed were developed by two committees. One was the, the Community Culture Vision document of 2008. I was the lead consultant on that project and we talked about how do we link Little Gates to the rest of the downtown and the importance of streetscape. And at the same time, the Greater Downtown Action Plan Committee was working on the redevelopment of downtown. And they, so we, I spent quite a bit of time working with those consultants and they were working with me so that the documents fit well together when they were both approved. So you'll see when you walk down that street, you, you know, you see the public art, you'll see the, the inlay in the sidewalk, you'll see a lot of things that are related to culture. That came through the coordination of both those efforts. Four lanes of traffic, slow it down a little bit um, and make the downtown an experience, not a, not a thoroughfare. The development of downtown Red Deer is not without its critics. There's not enough parking. The Ross Street patio and Veterans Park take up too much street space. They were never in the original plan and were built as an afterthought. Drivers bitterly oppose the politically divisive Red Deer bike lanes project. They also argue that paying for parking in parkades is not conducive to shopping, doing business, or experiencing downtown. The misfires throughout the downtown planning process are wounds that are still healing. Some ideas have been more, um, more practical than others. Uh, but I think the current concept, uh, uh, basically, uh, and with uh, the architects who are working on the design of Riverwalk right now, is the most practical. And it also, uh, hopefully, that uh, square might even host some of the games activities. And there is a vision of a future bridge from that square over to Bower Ponds. So the idea, the vision, is to travel from Barrett Park right along the street, right cross Taylor, right through Riverlands, major square on the river, and then cross over into Bower Ponds. Mayor Morris Flewelling's administration from 2003 to 2013 came with sky-high oil prices and another Alberta oil boom. Flewelling also had a love for heritage and culture. Preserving historic buildings and infrastructure during this time was trendy. 
The idea to engineer heritage and culture into a community's architecture was a worldwide trend best exemplified by something called the Jane's Walk. Jane Jacobs was born in 1916, and she lived in the U.S. for a lot of years. Probably one of the first things that propelled her to be successful was her 1961, she started, she published her first book called uh, Death and Life of Great American Cities. Around that time, the urban planners in New York were planning to put a freeway through Lower Manhattan, through Greenwich Village, oh a freeway. Imagine if that had happened. Since its inception in 2007, the Jane's Walk happens in cities across North America and around the world. The Walk is a series of neighborhood walking tours. They are usually held during the first weekend of May to coincide with Jane Jacobs' birthday. Paul Harris is offering a Jane's Walk today to see what Red Deer might look like in the winter. Yeah, this is too wide. This doesn't say, come and walk me. Right. So thinking of that design idea that we were talked about on the corner, if these buildings were all as tall as the street is wide, how would that feel then? Would the street feel quite as wide? The walks are usually about architecture and heritage, but can offer a more personal take on the local culture, the social history, and the planning issues faced by residents. The Metropolitan Block used to be Metropolitan Hardware in the early 1900s, and then it's been gone through a whole series of iterations over the number of years. And then most recently, it was Looney Lane. That's probably what people remember it as. Well, it's, a, it's an expensive building to renovate. Lots of people said I should have knocked it down. The development has seen extensive cost overruns and delays, mostly because of changes in the building code. But then you're losing the heritage of your city when you knock a building down. The city councils of the 70s and 80s didn't have foresight to hang on to the historical buildings in the downtown. If you walk through here, there's very few of them left. So we could have added to that and just started over and had another knockdown stucco building like every other one downtown, or we could restore what was there and, and bring some life back to our history and identity, which is more true to our ethics. Another example of this is the Green Block, a jewelry store called Artistry in Gold now occupies the building's main floor. Yeah, and that's a great upgrade because when we moved here, that old sandstone building was, had been painted white and that owner uh, spent time sandblasting that building and restoring it to his credit. It really adds to the community. Even now, with much of the downtown rejuvenation in the construction phase, problems arise and not the least of which is the severe downturn in the city's economy. It looks good. There are certain uh, energies that we're putting into right now into the uh, social infrastructure. One of those issues that came to light recently was the fact that the uh, province had not funded a shelter uh, in the downtown and the city had to immediately react to that need because of the closure of Baraka Place. But really, the uh, historic downtown core, we've done a lot. For example, there was the first project that we did out of the 2009 Greater Downtown Action Plan was Veterans Park. And then we have the uh, uh, summer uh, Ross Street patio, which is operating very well throughout the summer. And then, of course, we did uh, a revitalized Gates Avenue in terms of its appearance, which the infrastructure had become worn out. The underground services needed complete replacement. The historic downtown, we've done a lot of work, but we knew we had to do that work before Riverlands because that was the phase one of the project. I'm Amanda Gould. I'm the executive director here for the Downtown Business Association. The Downtown Business Association, we, we've been around for just over 30 years and our primary purpose is to support our businesses that are located within the core. And we support those businesses in a number of different ways, but we're also here to make sure that the business environment that our businesses do business in is as positive and vibrant as can be. There's been a number of businesses that have invested in the downtown, and anything from our small businesses right up to our big businesses that occupy second floor space and above. 
some of our great ones, I mean, you just need to look at somebody like Stantec or Nova, both invested in the downtown, both are located here. And then you can look at some other businesses as well that have had the opportunity to leave, but have stayed here because of what their employees want, which is to have access to all of the amenities that downtown offers. If you take some of our little cafes and restaurants, of which we have over 40 in the downtown, some of those really are invested in what the downtown could be. For example, Dose, for example, uh, the new one, the Chill Out Cafe, you know, all of our cafes. Some have been here a long time, some have only been here a little while, but they're all invested in the same thing, the future of downtown. Craig Curtis, City Manager, and it's my pleasure to act as MC for this morning's surprise announcement. In 2015, Red Deer's population crossed over 100,000. It is firmly established as Alberta's third largest city. The plans to create a cultural space where the past and the future can meet in the center of the community make sense if Red Deer wants to shed its image of being a redneck backwater town along the way to Calgary or Edmonton. Well, it takes all kinds to make a community, doesn't it? Like, I wouldn't say that we're redneck any more than I would say that we're culturally minded. We've got aspects of both in our community. And we should. Wouldn't it be boring if all we had were one type of person in our community. We need, you know, we need a little rough edges to sand off the rough edges on the neighbor, you know.